Hi, Sam Conlog at Infusion Studios here with the second part in a two-part tutorial about color grading in Adobe After Effects. In part one, we focused on using the grading plugin Magic Bullet Looks from Red Giant Software. Uh, part two will be a bit more advanced um, and will largely be using native color tools, uh, which will mean you won't need Magic Bullet Looks or some other plugin for the color end of it, um, though there will be some other plugins involved. Um, our subject this time around is a little walkthrough animation or walk around animation I did of a 72 Chevelle I modeled. Let's jump over to Premiere so we can see the shot. So here's the finished shot. Okay, that kind of goes on like that. It's just a little walk around. And as you can see, it's pretty heavily graded. Um, lots of things going on. Obviously some color grading. Uh, there's noise. There's glare. There's this frame. There's vignetting. Um, edge blur. A whole bunch of things going on. Um, so I'm going to give you a peek at what the original looked like. So here's the original render. So let's watch that. So you can see pretty pretty different um, Far Cry from what we have once we get done with our grading. Uh, also, I'm clearly you know pushing it to emulate film. Uh, in this case, sort of a eight millimeter, sixteen millimeter look um, from the late '60s or '70s. Uh, not with all the scratch and all that kind of thing, but just kind of pushing the color and the framing and the vignetting in that direction, just to give it a style. Um, also, there is motion blur going on that's done in post, and so we'll get into all of that. So it's not just a color grading tutorial, actually. I'll talk about everything um, on the compositing side that needed to happen to make the shot uh, come out as I wanted it here in the end. Um, all right, let's move over to After Effects. And I'm going to pick one frame. So what I've put up on the blog is all the passes I had for this one frame. Um, it's a little too much data to go throwing up the whole shot. But that way, if you want to play around with it, you'll have all the OpenEXR uh, files for the RGB color. So here they are, actually. Uh, color, reflection, refraction, velocity, z-depth. Uh, I have wire in there, but I mean, you can use it if you want. I didn't use it. Um, and what we're looking at, what we were looking at previously was the RGB, just raw. Um, again, those are all 32-bit color. So here's our, what, a, what I call our final comp, or Chevelle final. I'll close up this stuff. And actually, most of the color work happens in a subcomp, um, which is Chevelle, Chevelle assembled, which I'll pop open here. But we're, we're going to start working in the final comp. And what I'm going to do is sort of work backwards. I'm going to start from the top uh, of the render order or, or stack, or whatever you want to call it, but from the top of our comp, and work our way down uh, and sort of peel back the layers of what's going on. Um, the first being this sort of dirty film frame here, which is simply a Photoshop file, uh, you know, painted, um, and nothing special going on there. It's just set to multiply. No effect on it or anything. That's just a graphical overlay. So Photoshop file with an alpha channel and it just makes that black edge there uh, implying a film frame. The next thing is um, actually let's take a look in Premiere again so you can kind of see it. This subtle little flicker of exposure um, it's kind of hard to see but you see it best right here. There's a subtle increase and decrease in the brightness um, and what that is is just trying to emulate you know with with old film cameras or home movie film cameras anyway the quality of the film the you know might be old film whatever the exposure of every frame is not necessarily the same um, 
So I'm just, or it's not aged the same. So what I've done is just taken a levels effect and slightly boosted it, slightly boosted the gamma, um, which you do just by pulling this little guy here in the middle. Uh, and then to make the, uh, to animate the, you know, fading that in and out basically uh, is what I'm doing. If I hit U, I'll get my animated uh, attributes. And here I've actually just got a little tiny expression uh, transforming the opacity with the wiggle expression. So I'm just telling it to randomly vary up and down on the opacity, basically fading this effect in and out, uh, or almost turning it on and off every frame doing some random number um, of opacity. So that's how that's getting applied. So depending on what frame you're on, it will either look like it's affecting it or not. Um, and then we step down to the next layer, which is film grain. And I didn't use a film grain plugin. This is just straight up noise, uh, which is really the easiest way to do it. But if you, I mean, you can add uh, more of a, an actual film grain look. Um, or there's film grain plugins out there to simulate certain film stock. I didn't do that, so this is just straight up noise um, and a little box blur. So the noise, let's take off the box blur for a second. Um, the noise is just a color noise set to 50%. Um, also, this layer has a 50% opacity, so it's not full blown. You know, this would be too much and just looks looks just like color noise, looks just bad bad color noise, but doesn't look like film noise. Um, but so this was easy enough to do just really quickly to get some noise. The uh, box blur is just to soften, take a close look at the grain. It softens up this grain, but it also softens, you know, all the pixels. Um, so the entire shot just gets, gets a little softened. Okay, so turn that off. So as I said, we're just sort of peeling these layers away. So it already looks uh, quite a bit different. And actually, the grain does have a certain element of um, contrast, builds up contrast a little bit too. Okay, so now we are down to our subcomp, or what will be our subcomp. But before getting into it, let's talk about the motion blur setup. Um, and this isn't a grading thing, this is more of just a, a finishing. When you're dealing with CG, uh, how you handle blur really matters, and there's all sorts of ways to do it. Um, if you're not too concerned about render times or flexibility, you can do your motion blur as well as your focal blur all uh, in your virtual camera or say in your 3D package. So in this case, if I wanted to have my motion blur and depth of field done by V-Ray in Max, I'd set it up that, that way, use the physical camera. It totally worked fine. The only reason I don't, well, two reasons that I, I tend not to do it that way, sometimes I do, but I tend not to if I want one, the flexibility, either because I'm not quite sure what I want the final look to look like, or I know that I maybe can't achieve it with the in-camera look. Um, two is, oh, actually three reasons, okay, so two <laughs> is render times. Um, motion blur and focal blur, especially combined, can really boost your render times, make them longer than you maybe have time for. This rendered pretty fa pretty fast. Um, had I thrown those in at render time, it, it it would have increased it considerably. So, though that's getting better all the time. Um, that's not as bad as it used to be, but anyway, using it in a po post workflow is still sort of my preferred way of handling it. Um, and the third reason would be the flexibility to change your mind about uh, just how much blur you're going to have, um, how much motion blur, how much depth of field blur. And also, if you want the, in this case, I wanted to animate the focal depth. Um, a little more freely. It's hard to do. That's really hard to do in Max uh, in, in a natural way because you don't get feedback from the viewport, really. Uh, at least with a V-Ray physical camera, you don't. So in After Effects, that allows me to use um, the Frischluft Lens Care plugin, and I can just pick and choose my, my focal depth and even pick it out of the scene. But I'll show that later. Uh, so anyway, regarding the, uh, the motion blur. So what I'm using to do the motion blur first I have a vector pass or velocity vectors and though it's a crazy looking pass what this is um, is essentially a vector pass that's telling you know where the camera motion or the object motion in this case though it's camera motion 
um, where the motion is and in what directions. Uh, so you want to feed that in to a plugin that can understand it. In this case, so actually that footage is off. That's just there as a utility uh, a pass. So if we go over to the actual plugin. So this is real smart motion blur. There's other plugins out there um, that do an equally good job. And you just throw it the pass uh, with the velocity in it. And if I shut that off, you'll see the motion blur goes away completely. So fully crisp, uh, motion blurred. Try to find, yeah. So here's a high motion shot, uh, part of the shot here. So without it, you can see it's a significantly different look. And also without it, when you actually run things, uh, play things back real time, then you'll you'll see you know feels more jerky, feels unnatural, doesn't feel filmed. Um, so motion blur is extremely important. So that's how that's handled. Um, another uh, caveat to that is that when you're using both motion blur and depth of field in post, you have to little the two have to consider each other to a certain degree because your depth of field is going to be controlled by a z depth pass. Um, grayscale Z depth pass, similar to the velocity pass, but it's just telling the camera what's close, what's far away, so it knows, okay, what is it you want to focus on. Um, and the way that I do it is I apply a motion blur, basically this same effect, also to that Z depth pass before it gets fed into the camera focal blur. Um, but anyway, I'll cover that once we once we get in here. Okay, so we're gonna dig down into the beauty assembly or beauty assembled comp and there's a lot going on here um, it's gonna be a little trickier to peel things away so I'll, I'll sort of go, go in order of importance um, from here down there's not a lot going on these are pretty subtle changes um, where most of our, our color work is happening is in this grade master, uh, which is just a adjustment layer. Um, the flare, which is using optical flares from videocopilot.net. And then two uh, vignettes, a radial and a top and bottom vignette. So what I'll do is I'm gonna shut these guys off. The flare and the, the master grade, actually I'm gonna shut them all off. Um, the flare and the master grade are tethered, but also the vignette and, and FX uh, flare layer are tethered. And by tethered, I mean like without them both on, you really, uh, it would be hard to know really what the desired result was. So, for example, if I throw on my vignettes without the flare on, this just looks strange. This isn't what we want. This isn't, you know, at no point did I view it like this and, and try to make it like that. So, uh, that's where it gets a little tricky is there's a lot of jumping around. Um, so, what I actually applied first before I did anything color-wise. So what we're seeing here uh, is almost the raw render, not quite. Uh, and actually, let's go back to I think 319 was our frame we're working with before. Okay. Um, so I'm going to throw on the flare. So here's our optical flare. And it does um, heavily, heavily affect the shot. This is probably the one, um, aside from the color work, the one other chunk um, that has the biggest effect on the shot. And mostly it's it's, uh, I mean, you can see it's desaturating, it's it's lightening the, lighting the shot up. Um, so, you know, part of the color work is, is actually countering this. But another reason, here we go, to have this glare, the primary reason, aside from the atmosphere, so like in part one, we used the, uh, the haze, flare, glare uh, component of Magic Bullet Looks. So this sort of this is a similar idea. This is more to create atmosphere, um, but it has the bonus effect of being a 3D positional flare. Um, and actually, you can see my little, here's the light, After Effects light. So if I move that around, here, let's set this to fast draft. There we go. So if I move this around, you can see my flare moves. Now, in actuality, I'm not moving the flare, I'm moving the camera. So this is the other significant part. So we've got our flare, again optical flares. Now in order for that to work, it needs that light, our After Effects light, which is here. And the other component it needs in order for this flare to work 3D positionally as we shot, saw in the finished shot, 
um, whereas if the, as the camera moves around, the nature of the flare changes and the optical elements is a camera. Um, so let's go in top view and just take a look real quick. Actually, we'll just isolate the camera by itself. So camera's got all that camera motion in it from Studio Max. Um, and that's key. Without that, your flare would just sit still um, unless you hand animated it. And it'd be hard to hand animate that to make any sense uh, to match at all what's going on uh, in the shot. So in this case, I used, let's see, where is it? There it is. The compositor link from Autodesk or Studio Max comes with a compositor link that allows After Effects and Studio Max to... Uh, in a limited way, talk to each other, send layers back and forth. So originally this camera layer came in as an Autodesk link layer. Um, I also have a null ground check that is just something I bring in. It's, it's a flat plane of sort of where the car was, roughly, um, so that I know that my camera position is correct. Sometimes cameras come in flipped or whatever. So that's just a quick way to know if, if it's right uh, when you first bring it in. But anyway, so those are key key components to making that work. So Again, if I zoom out, you can see here's here's the flare, uh, or the the light that represents the flare of the camera. The camera's pointing here, so you can imagine. Actually, let's just go ahead and turn on our um, little ground check thing. So that's not quite the footprint of the car, but it's roughly where the car is. So as this moves around, you can kind of already get a sense of okay, that's where the front of the car roughly is here. As the camera's coming in and focusing on it, the garage that's behind it is back here. So this flare. If we go back into our active camera, um, we'll turn off our null ground check. Um, this flare is out here, uh, it's supposed to be slightly above and, and beyond uh, to the left of the garage, and we're just implying you know, a sunlight. And that's where the sun was in the HDRI that I used to, to light the scene. So you can see here in the reflection. So now the glare and our lighting actually make sense, they correspond. Uh, to work together to actually sell that that's where the light is, that makes sense where the glare is coming from. Um, so those are things, you know, just kind of planned out in advance when lighting it, um, you know, where's the sun source or the main light source coming from, where's the glare going to come from, and just making sure that works. Uh, okay, so let's go back to our, our frame we're working with here. Uh, so one result of this flare now is that it's all wildly washed out and overexposed. Um, ultimately we want some washout, but we don't want it this overexposed. So the first way to deal with that was to apply some vignettes. So the first was a radial vignette. And as I was saying, you know, without the flare, this vignette doesn't make much sense. It's way too strong. But when it's working against a 32-bit flare, uh, this just brings it back into balance, not even really that significant um, a drop. So, and what's going on here is I've got an exposure effect up here, so that's actually what's dropping the exposure. Uh, and I'm using an offset, which is more of a, it crushes um, the blacks more than an exposure, drop in exposure would. So I'm already starting to kind of force it into that film uh, look where you've got crushed blacks and, and maybe blown out highlights more so than you would see in just a regular still photo or something. Um, and the gamma's pulled down a little bit, which also increases the uh, contrast. So that's what's going on there. And then as far as the radial, you know, making it a radius, it's just a ellipse mask with a feather. Uh, a little bit expansion, negative expansion, but a big feather, almost 500 pixels. And that's controlling that. Um, then on top of that, I add a top-bottom vignette, and this is more of a sort of a matte box or however you want to see it or you know just consider it a regular grading choice um, so rather than the traditional only radial vignette there's a, a bit of vignetting happening at the top and the bottom and that's also controlled in this in this case just with a rectangular mask um, with also a pretty big feather almost 300 pixels so those two combined those start to get the flare under control. We still want to see the flare. We mostly want to bring out these flare elements, these lens elements um, of the optical flare. Uh, so that's you know these three majors, and then we're going to go over here to the grade master, and this is where the rest of the color work 
is first I'm gonna oops, keep that on. First I'm gonna shut those all off before I go turn it on. So I'll turn it on. Um, this is where most of the stuff's happening. First thing I'll note is that I'm using the HDR compander um, on, and this is sort of just a technical note. When you have, if you notice the the little uh, caution symbol here next to my uh, red adjust, which is actually a selective color. I've renamed some of these effects, so it might be confusing, but that's a selective color effect right there. And this is a vibrance adjustment, bring down the vibrance. Um, these aren't 32-bit effects in After Effects. So if you're going to use non-32-bit effects, you need to throw a compander in front and in back, or top and bottom, uh, basically to compress the 32-bit range or the linear uh, 0 to 1 range into 0 to 1. Um, it can't accept anything above um, 8 bit can't um, or even 16 bit and then the bottom one is to expand it back up and the reason you do this um, is simply so that you don't destructively affect your uh, color bit depth uh, so anyway what's going on so I'll deal with those those first so the first thing is a little adjustment to the reds um, or in this case really the only red in the shot is the red of the car and though it rendered out as sort of a candy apple red, that's not really how I think the film would respond to it. I think it'd be hard for the film to show that tone, and I just want to push it a little, uh, a little more orange, but not so orange that it feels like the car was, you know, Dukes of Hazard orange or um, close to that, but not as bright. So a little red adjust, and then I also pull back the vibrance the whole shot and vibrance is sort of like um, hue and saturation um, hue shift saturation so you're basically just pulling back if I, if I set that back to zero whoop, zero those out what I'm actually doing is compensating so I'm, I'm pulling back the vibrance but I'm increasing the saturation so it doesn't just desaturate the shot and what this does is reduces overall color contrast, which is another thing that I'm sort of implying the film might initially do. Um, and then some of these layers, you end up, you know, again, you're pushing and pulling with these different effects, so sometimes you might remove some red, add some red later, remove it again um, as you go. I'm going to leave the curve contrast uh, layer off for now because that is sort of the big final change which I added last. Um, so the next thing is to add just a subtle, really subtle green tone almost unnoticeable it's only in the mids so what I did is I just took a tritone kept the whites and the blacks normal and then changed the mids to this uh, light green and then brought it way down so the the blend with original setting is way up to 89 percent which just means a lot less green if I left it at default that's what you'd get so I'm just kind of blending in a tiny bit of green um, and I do a little sepia, which is actually a photo filter. So again, I renamed some of these. So this is a photo filter effect. And I'm using a warming filter uh, right there. And it's cranked up pretty high. The default would be 25. So if I left it at the default, that's where it would be. So I pumped it up to 41, preserve luminosity so it doesn't darken the shot. Um, and that's just to warm it up. So again, you know, pushing and pulling. I've removed some reds and bring some reds and yellows back in. Uh, I'll leave these two off because that is actually a final step as well. So let's take a look at the curve contrast. So when we throw this on, big change happens. Um, and that's all in one effect. So up until this point, this is sort of the color direction I want to go, kind of. Um, you know, it's in the direction that I want to go, but it's certainly not the contrast that I want. This is very washed out. Um, really want more contrast than that. So the first thing with the curve contrast, or it's just a curves effect, is to create an S-curve that's very heavily weighted, uh, in this case, to the highlights, because I wanted to blow certain things out, give that sort of overexposed look like the film just can't handle it, uh, but have a natural, again, working 32-bit, when you blow it out, you get sort of these natural blowouts. Um, and then push the blacks darker. Um, so that you you really get this crush um, feel. In fact, I could have pushed it even further. Um, so that's what's going on there. And then there is a slight color adjustment in there. 
in the reds. So I've pulled the reds down a little. Um, if I pull that out, you can see the reds just start to go a little nuts. Um, so just working in the red channel in curves, that doesn't affect what's happening here overall. That's our overall RGB contrast curve. But in the reds, just pulling that down, and you could go even further again. And it's really mostly affecting the reds, not entirely. You're getting some of that that photo filter. Uh, it removes some of that and evens it out. So that's a big shift there. And then lastly, these two guys are two just slight exposure adjustments toward the end. This one is boosting up again the shadows just a tiny bit and then crushing them down again. Um, and trying to come, what I'm trying to do there is just harden the line between the crush, between the, the shadows and the midtones, so that it's not as even uh, or smooth a gradient from one to the other. So now we'll take a look, uh, we'll go back and take a look at these slightly less significant but still important adjustments down here. Um, and I should note too, I haven't been saying what every layer is, but whenever doing the, the color work, those are all adjustment layers. Uh, in the case of the flare, that is a uh, solid, which then has the optical flares plug-in attached. And like I was saying, um, you know, being a plug-in, uh, and this is a great plug-in, all this stuff is very editable. So this is um, a slightly customized flare. It's based off one of the presets. Uh, and you can adjust any of the elements in there, add in more elements. Um, you know, there's some of this little lens orb dirt stuff. I, in a retrospect, maybe wish that I'd done a little bit more of that because that doesn't really come out in the camera. But anyway, just thought I'd pop that open so you can see. Um, so now we'll go ahead and turn these off that we've gone through. So we're back to almost our raw shot. Um, and let's also go back to frame 319, which is where I was working. There you go. So at this moment, we're, we're in a pretty crisp uh, part of the shot, which is a good moment to show these other effects. So slight glow, so down here on the glow, um, this is an adjustment layer, low opacity. Um, here's what it would look like if I let it totally go. That's just way too much. Um, and I, I'll often apply an, effects, an effect, and rather than doing a lot of the adjustment here, once I get the rough look I like, I will use opacity basically to bring it in and out. Um, which again in 32-bit works great because it's just additive, so it's really just adding adding to the value rather than on any kind of curve where the behavior of opacity may be, may be different. Um, so that was at 21. So just a slight glow affects any of the highlights and even some of the, the mid-tones. So we'll turn that off. Um, the next thing was doing a, uh, this is using another element of the Frischluft Lens Care plugin, which we'll, we'll look at when we get into the next layer. But it has two elements. One is you can control focal blur with a Z-depth pass. Another is that you can just make something out of focus entirely uh, and then apply a mask to it to control it. So in this case, if I remove that mask, everything will get blurry. And if I pump that way up, you'll just get, you know, these really nice bouquet uh, blurs and stuff. So anyway, that's what that effect is, um, and then that layer, again, just an adjustment layer, and controlling it uh, with an inverted ellipse. Very similar. In fact, I might have just copied the one from the vignette, so I think it's, it's pretty much almost the same. And and this is just to imply sort of some barrel blur, or, or you know, to imply that the lens on this little home movie camera, or whatever it is, uh, is not that great, not that perfect, so it's getting bit of this bad uh, barrel distortion, or uh, well, actually not barrel distortion, but, but blur. Um, so let's go ahead and shut that off. And now we're down to the depth of field. And depending on which part of the shot we're in, um, you know, I, I animated the depth of field. So if I hit U, we'll see all the keyframes here. And it's just jumping, um, jumping on how much, you know, between the values of how much it is or the focal point actually. So uh, staying consistent with how much radial blur uh, or the radius of the focal blur. So try to find an extreme example. Like when we get down on the tire, um, at that moment it's in focus. Let's back up. And then here it's not in focus. So let's just move our way 
frame by frame into it. Okay, so as the camera moves, I'm just implying that the operator or the auto focus on the camera, though this camera wouldn't have autofocus, um, so instead the person using the camera, you know, changing the focal ring, isn't doing such a great job following focus, so they're, they're kind of missing overshooting it. Um, and that's sort of a handheld thing to imply a handheld shot. Um, and how that works is again we're feeding it like we did with the motion blur pass or motion vector pass. Uh, we have a z-depth pass that's being fed into it and that is down here. And if we take a look at that, in order to take a look at that we'll have to actually go into yet another subcomp. So this is the z-depth assembly comp that I made. And this is a z-depth um, pass out of Max or out of V-Ray. The init initially is all crisp, so it's grayscale. You know, white is closer to the camera, uh, gray or, or black is farther away. It's full 32-bit, so actually a lot of the detail that's in it you can't see, um, can't easily see those gradations uh, just with your eye. So um, a little, you know, here the car just comes out pure white. But if you were to add a levels or a curves onto it or an exposure and play with it, you would see that there's more detail in there. But anyway, um, in this case, to accommodate the, the motion blur so that our focal blur, because if you think about it, so the camera, if you're filming something and you move and you get blur, it's sort of, you know, which is happening first or, or, or what's affecting what. Um, anything we do in comp here isn't going to be true to reality, we're faking it, but you still want to consider your focal blur will be also motion blurred. So, if the camera's not moving and you're focusing on a subject, uh, let's see, we'll take here. Um, so this is without motion blur on the whole shot, but there is focal blur. And this focal blur, uh, if the camera was s totally still, would have no motion blur on it. But once the camera moves, you're going to have motion blur uh, on your focal blur. So in my mind, that means focal blur happens first and then motion blur happens on top of it but in order for the focal blur to really consider the motion blur you need to apply motion blur to whatever is driving your focal blur totally confusing but um but in practice here's what it looks like basically is you know here's the same setup as the motion blur back in the uh, the final back like like we had here and i've just got my velocity pass again a copy of it or duplicate and then motion blur and then that's that motion blur is changing the nature of my z-depth pass so that we have some variation uh, in in what's happening like a blurred uh, focal blur uh, motion blur and focal blur and then if so if we come back here we'll see that actually the edge is now a little bit different subtle maybe not completely necessary but it's a step um, that you might as well take if you're you're trying to do both um, Okay, so we're going to jump out of the C-depth assembly shot uh, comp here. And we'll go ahead and turn off the depth of field now that we understand roughly how that's working. And the rest of what's going on is just these two layers here, a reflect and a refract. And this is just to boost, it's really one adjustment, um, but it's to boost the reflections. Um, if we take a look at just the passes, this has a curves on it. That's the raw reflection pass. And the curves is so that I really just wanted mostly the highlights. And that is just screened over um, the original shot. And then similarly, with the refract, except I'm doing an add. Um, and that's just to brighten up those headlights. I felt that originally the reflections were just a little dull and wouldn't survive the color process as well. Um, so with that, we're now down to our original, original uh, CG render. Okay, so let's go and turn everything back on. And we will then jump up to our final and turn these guys on. And now we're back to our final uh, final shot. So, hope that was helpful. Um, I know a lot of... I was debating the best way to approach this, whether to build up or, or go... But I felt backward. Uh, made more sense to peel everything back for the most part. Um, but that's how it's put together. Um, every shot is a little different, so you know some really don't require 
this much messing around. Others, um, I'll often do a full render pass setup, uh, a full reflect, refract, global illumination, diffuse filter, all of that stuff um, is sometimes necessary. With this one, I didn't do all that. I just did a beauty pass plus the reflect and the refract. Um, and the velocity and z depth would be the other passes. So those will be available to you on the blog. Um, I felt it was a pretty good position for uh, position of the flare. Uh, not too much motion blur or anything going on, not crazy focal blur, um, really just the background. So something to play with. Um, I would be curious to see what people come up with. But anyway, till the next tutorial, uh, that's it. Thanks for watching.